We'll be knocking out two biblical books this week, 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Both of these books originated as letters Paul sent to the early Christians in Corinth, but the style and tone of the two is radically different. We'll start, of course, with a series of bizarre, sexually repressive, and logically irreconcilable answers to doctrinal questions that Paul presents with his first behemoth letter. This book needs some choose-your-own-adventure options or something. Like that. <laughs> I would have skipped be... to Revelations a while ago. That would be awesome. The Choose Your Own Adventure Bible. Look for it eventually on skatingatheist.com. And, of course, we could probably do a babble without Lucinda, but why the hell would we want to do something like that? So joining us, as always, is my lovely bride, Lucinda. What did you think of Corinthians? That its title should never be used in the same sentence as the word think. Excellent point. Okay, I apologize for the oversight. So uh, get us going here if you don't mind. So we start off by saying Jesus a lot. I mean, seriously, the words Jesus Christ show up eight times in the first two sentences of the book. That's correct. And at least once in the first five. Yeah, but even with the Jesus stutters, Paul gets to the point pretty quick in this one. They need unity in the church because if they can't agree on basic questions of doctrine, everybody's going to know they're full of shit. They can't agree on basic questions of doctrine, by the way. (laughs) Excellent point. He also makes an excuse for why God does dumb shit. Apparently, so many humans are doing dumb shit that God thinks that we all just speak fluent dumb shit and wanted to speak to us in the language that we know. Yeah. The, the preamble to the entire section basically says, all the wise and intelligent people are definitely going to hate this, but, and already right there, it's a problem. <laughs> right. But we all need to get on the same page about this Jesus stuff we all made up. It's not a great start. It does not inspire confidence. Right, and in the very first chapter, he inaugurates the rallying cry that Christians are still going to lean on 2,000 years later when they start to faction. He says, hey, we may not agree on everything, but at least we can all agree that Jews and pagans are fuck monkeys. Am I right? Am I right? (laughs) God hates them, right? Paul of Tarsus doesn't always persecute tribes, but when he does, he prefers the Jews and the pre-Muslims. Yes, exactly. (laughs) And then he blows it with this attempted compliment to his recipients where he says, I mean, just look how weak and stupid you guys are. Oh, my God. (laughs) So bad. (laughs) And then he opens up uh, chapter 2 with more glorifying bloviation. 1 Corinthians 2, 4, quote, My speech and proclamations were not with plausible words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the spirit and of power, end quote. So, you know. Don't worry about the stuff I said that turned out to be wrong. Those weren't supposed to be plausible words. Give me a fucking break, you know. They're spirit words. Yeah, quite an elaborate, it doesn't matter if what I say is stupid defense he mounts there. Mm. He starts saying, well, of course the non-Christians are going to say our stuff sounds insane because, you know, they don't have Jesus in them, so they're Mm. not privy to all the new shit. Right, right, exactly. I'd also like to draw everybody's attention to chapter 3, verse 2. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for solid food. So, congratulations to Paul for convincing the Corinthians that the stuff coming out of there was milk. (laughs) Say what you will about it, but that is an impressive feat. Or, in secret Bible code, an impressive double penis. (laughs) Check the translation. He also says in verse 17 that if anybody kills a Christian, God will kill them back. Mm -hmm. Eventually. He doesn't say when. Then chapter 4 reads like a compliment that never gets around to being a compliment. You know, Paul is saying like, I mean, let's face it. You guys aren't the wisest people in the world, and you're not the strongest, and you're not the prettiest, or the wealthiest, or the healthiest, or the most graceful, or the best smelling, and everybody's just sure that there's going to be a butt here eventually, except there never is. (laughs) Well, he does point out that the solution of being dumb, weak, ugly, broke sick clumsy and foul Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's to be more like him yes exactly (laughs) right so you know how i was absolutely unbearable to hang out with well i sent my son timothy to go remind you about all that stuff (laughs) just like me please don't murder him Mm -hmm. i really i only say that because when i was leaving the last time i did i got the distinct impression a bunch of you were plotting to murder me so this letter is to make sure you know that i was right and you people are all wrong, and please don't murder my son, who's about to show up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, no son, brother, friend, a lot of well, titles for Timothy there, but definitely not gay lover. That was definitely not it. And you know that chapter 5 is going to be fun right away, because it opens with this prom- promising series of words. Quote, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that is not even found among the pagans. End quote, so... Now, there's Seriously. a chapter oh, opening no. that'll wake you back up mid-epistle. Well, and as promising as it seemed, the perversity he was talking about was fucking your stepmom. <laughs> yeah. So he oversold that one just a tad. A little bit, yeah. Seriously, with all the crazy, weird sex stuff going on in first century Greece, the best intelligence Paul got was about one guy that fucked his hot stepmom. Right? Seriously? Come on. I'm picturing the Corinthians reading this letter and just 
tears of laughter. <laughs> Especially the other 200 people were at that particular pansexual orgy with the dude and his stepmom who accidentally crossed swords. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> the rest yeah. of them must have found that entertaining. Yeah, the part about cleaning out the yeast isn't as promising as it seemed in the first glance either. No, yeah, I was hoping for more. He also says you're not allowed to eat with hookers and drunks, which eliminates all the best eateries right away. But more importantly, if you're taking this thing seriously, it means that Paul is condemning Jesus. Exactly. And then he tells everybody to stop suing each other. Mm -hmm. I mean, come on, isn't it better to just, you know, be swindled? Well, something tells me Chapter 6 is going to be a lot more popular all of a sudden if the Supreme Court gets the marriage equality thing right. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, and all about how you should never listen to the secular courts when religious bullshit is available. Right. Yeah, but even if Justice Scalia decided to use this particular chapter as an argument against marriage equality, he's definitely going to run into trouble. Verse 9 says something about men having sex with men won't get into heaven. Mm -hmm. But this was just a sloppy translation of two different words in the original Greek – that actually mean the passive gay sexer and the active gay sexer. Those were two separate <laughs> words, not just men and men. So right. if one dude just lies there, it's no good, I guess. But <laughs> the way I'm reading this, as long as they both enjoy themselves and there's a little bit of, you know, power bottom going on and <laughs> they trade off innings on the mound, that's legal. <laughs> I don't think they're interpreting that correctly. Interesting midrash. And, and by the way, according to verse 13 of chapter 6, your dick belongs to God and God swallows. Yeah, a lot of member talk here. Mm -hmm, yeah, uh, I had to write this one down actually because it seemed like such a good porn plot to pitch to the people at Pure Flix. Uh, chapter six, verse fifteen. Do you not know that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? And I'm sure the Corinthians are saying, "Yeah, baby." Night that minute. <laughs> Get your phone. But the real action in First Corinthians is definitely in chapter seven because that's the one where Paul talks about how awesome not fucking is. <laughs> now he does admit that fucking is a good alternative to beating off, but nothing beats not having any orgasms at all. That's the <laughs> ideal. Yeah, he says, "I wish that all of you were as I am, mm -hmm. but each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. <laughs> Basically." How do I stay celibate? I'm a creepy, asexual, preachy asshole. But that doesn't work for everyone. That's not for everybody. Some of you might be pleasant, attractive people. I don't know. Nobody's perfect. you got to come up with your own strategy, though. He also comes out pro-marital rape, by the way, as Heath mentioned last week. Mm -hmm. And there must have been a ton of contention in the early church about what everybody was supposed to be doing with their dicks because he brings up the circumcision thing yet again. <laughs> so confusing. Yeah. And it says every dude should stick with whatever foreskin setup they had when they found Jesus. So just in case you were growing it back like a playoff beard, you should stop. <laughs> Don't do that. It's good information. Useless Thanks. fucking shit. And I think 1 Corinthians 7.21 is underutilized by atheists. This is the passage where, according to most biblical scholars, Paul recommends that slaves who are in a position to purchase their own freedom instead give that money to the church. Yes. Uh -huh. Fuck your freedom. And while you're still reeling from that, he says, now let's talk virgins. And I'm thinking, okay, you got my attention. But here's Paul's advice to the virgins of the world. Don't bother fucking anybody because Jesus is going to be back any minute. <laughs> Yeah. Be around. Yeah, the message in chapter 7 is clear. Fucking is evil, but God will forgive you sometimes. Might not, but sometimes Maybe. he Probably will. Yeah. yeah. So clearly Paul just has a checklist he's going through. He looks back at the letter. He's like, okay, so we got uh, we covered stepmother fucking, suing each other, not beating off. What else is vitally important? Uh, not eating sacrificed food to <laughs> idols. That's Idol it. food, That's, right. Yeah. yeah. Right, and his logic is downright swishy on everything. He dedicates a whole chapter to whether or not you should eat food sacrificed to idols, and by the end of it, you have no idea whether you should or it's, not. It's, it's, it's so hard to follow what the fuck he's yeah. saying. It's, it's like he's heard smart people talk before, and he's <laughs> just trying to mimic their style. You know, I know that they use some therefores now and again, and sometimes they'll juxtapose words. Your you know? position concurrently heretofore <laughs> would be improved upon. <laughs> but, but I got to admit, this was a good little selling point in the, at this spot. Christians can eat pretty much whatever they want now. Mm -hmm. It's a good announcement. It's got, mm -hmm. yeah. I'm sure people with non-medical dietary restrictions were just as annoying back in the day. Walking up to your 
street cart full of dead animals in Corinth. How many grams of gluten is in that rabbit? How long, <laughs> how long did you bleed it for? Dude, I don't, know, I don't know. I shot it in the face with a bone arrow and I put it in this box. <laughs> Pull up the line every day with this shit. It's a dead rabbit. Do you want it? Do you want the dead rabbit? <laughs> and then in chapter 9, the lady doth protest too much. Mm-hmm. The whole fucking chapter is about how it's God's will that Paul doesn't have a job and everybody takes care of him. And Paul, the apostolic couch surfer dedicates a whole fucking chapter of the Bible to why people should give him food and shit. (laughs) And in chapter 10, Paul reminds everyone that reading the Old Testament is still useful. For example, it's a great way to learn about how to avoid becoming part of an evil race and murdering the savior of humanity. So so keep checking up on that. One of the many benefits. And just when you're thinking to yourself, is this all the misogyny we're going to get? We uh, arrive at chapter 11, yeah, where Paul explains why all good Christian women should wear their burkas. And do whatever their husbands say. Yes, dear. He also points out that men who wear their hair long are a disgrace to themselves, so <laughs> get a haircut and a real job, Jesus. <laughs> and then he finally gets around to doling out the superpowers. Right. So if you become a Christian, you'll apparently be assigned one of the following superpowers at random. <laughs> Super wisdom, super faith. Healing powers, miracle powers, the ability to speak all languages, Mm -hmm. precognition, or the ability to command demons. Right. (laughs) I gotta say, though, if you're giving out superpowers and none of them are flying, I just don't trust them. Right, or invisibility, none of the good shit. And I'm sure it's like one of those McDonald's contests where, like, technically everybody wins, but, you know, (laughs) most of them, pretty much everybody just gets the half-priced fries or whatever. It's like, damn it, I got super faith, too. Aw, man. (laughs) <laughs> then he gets into that whole does an I say I am not a nose thing. And all I can really think in the back of my head is, I'm Jack's medulla oblongata. <laughs> Agent <laughs> Ridiculous. <laughs> then we come to probably the most well-known excerpt from Corinthians, the one where Paul explains that we see through a glass darkly, which basically comes in the midst of an explanation as to why other people seem to know way more stuff than him and be right more often. <laughs> That's what he was talking about. There's also the part about how Love is not envious or mm-hmm. proud or arrogant or rude or shitty about using the pen and the crossword. Love never <laughs> stops at the end of the merging. It's all, just a whole bunch of meaningless things that love isn't, which, of course, thousands of dudes getting married plagiarized when they couldn't come up with their own vows. Yeah, right, right. And according to Paul, by the way, the thing Christians should be striving for is the ability to prophecy. Right. I guess that's level nine Jesus power or something. But he talks on and on about how when you really master this being a Christian thing, you'll be able to see the future. Right. So all you guys are Christianing wrong. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> exactly. You're doing it wrong. I hate to be the one to tell you. <laughs> yeah, he also humble brags about being the very best tongue speaker in the, in the whole wide world. He's, he, he, but he at least has the decency to admit that babbling incoherently isn't as productive as not doing that. Saying real words. Exactly. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure – did I read this right? Did he suggest that you use – a translator when you yell yes. out meaningless nonsense <laughs> on the street? I'm not sure what he was picturing. <laughs> well, it seems like maybe it started like the, the speaking in tongues thing. Like he, one time he got stumped on a question by one of the, somebody in Corinth. You know, somebody says like, so how do we reconcile the problem of evil? And he says, Shabba, flamma, balamma, rabba, damma, ding, dong, mega, like a high, mega, hey, ho. And then he's got to make up an excuse for that later. You know, that was God talk. You didn't have a translator. Right, right. But then it started to catch on, so he had to write this letter to everyone and say, okay, guys, back off the speaking in tongues thing. Everybody thinks we've lost our fucking minds. <laughs> right. And That's we're insane. Stop it. <laughs> and I think we, we'd be remiss not it. to at least mention 14, 34, and 35 of this book, which reminds us that women should shut the fuck up and do what they're told. Mm-hmm. Now, most biblical scholars, pretty much all biblical scholars, believe that this one was added later and doesn't represent Paul's actual writing. And the way it just cuts in out of nowhere to disrupt the flow of the ramblings definitely supports that. So, yes, somebody read through this book a few centuries later or whatever and said, I don't think we've spent enough time on how inferior women are. <laughs> are, we being, let's, are we clear let's, on that? Let's add a little something here about how my <laughs> wife should fuck off. Let's just We're not doing t- it right. <laughs> tell my bitch where to go. And this was clearly just some dude who convinced his wife that Jesus died for, like, more blowjobs and butt sex, and then got pissed when <laughs> she showed up at church and started asking questions. Hey, so is it true? Made a rule that... against women talking at church. Yeah. You, you ask the questions at home. <laughs> Husband will figure it out for you. Yes, the butt sex and the blowjobs for yes, Jesus. Yes, by the yes, way. It's the real in thing. In case you were curious. Yeah. <laughs> also probably worth pointing out that Paul adds a new wrinkle in the discordant stories of Jesus' res- resurrection by clearly stating that he was buried rather than entombed. 
mm-hmm. in chapter 15, verse 4. And, and it also throws down a list of like who Jesus appeared to and when that doesn't fit with any of the accounts in the Gospels. And I, I think it's worth noting at this point that the people who wrote the Gospels had this book. Right, they <laughs> the had a reference there. book. Yes, exactly. They wanted consistency. They could have had it. They chose yeah. not to. I also like that he takes a minute to at least admit that if the Christ rising from the dead thing isn't true, they're all a bunch of dumbasses. Yeah, all right. At least he lays that down. <laughs> it's yeah. basically this grossly confused explanation of Pascal's backwards wager, <laughs> as told by a degenerate gambler who thinks it would be stupid to stop buying lottery tickets considering how much <laughs> money he already spent on improving the odds for next time <laughs> by losing this whole time. Yeah, right. exactly. Also, 1529 seems to suggest that the Mormons have it right and that baptizing the dead by proxy is a thing that Christians are supposed to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and then it takes the whole book for him to get to his real fucking point, but the last chapter opens up with instructions on how the Corinthians better have some fucking money for him when he swings by. <laughs> yeah. He goes all pimp on him and reminds him that they shouldn't have to wait until he arrives to start scraping to gather some coin. It should be there when he shows up. Yeah, and then he tells everybody to send his love to Tim, Bill, Uncle Ned. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> All of that stays in the book for some yeah, damn reason. Yeah, right? No idea why. Why do we need to know this? I know I said this before, but I'm like 99% sure you're still all planning to murder my son when he shows up and starts. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't. Seriously. Just don't. No. Don't murder my son. And that's going like to do it for First Corinthians, but that's not going to do it for the Babel this week. We've got another book coming up. But first, a quick break for an important public service announcement. 